Hi, my name is Reverend Campbell. You may know me from such shows as, well, this. I've got a great show for you this <laughs> month. I don't know why I opened it that way. That was really weird. I was going to do like a, this weird like, I don't know. I don't know what I was going to do. Anyway, thank you guys so much for joining us. We have a hell of a show for you this week, this month, this whatever interval you're tuning in. Thank you so much. I'm going to get to you people in the live chat room here in just a second. I'm going to introduce the people uh, that you just heard in just a second. Uh, but first, can we just talk for one moment about the majority of Democratic representatives in the United States Congress. Is it mandatory for you to be an incompetent leader to be elected as a Democrat? Or have we just been incredibly unfortunate from the beginning? We have a president who directed his lawyer to commit a crime. His lawyer committed the crime, admitted to it in court, and was convicted by a federal judge. This is concrete, factual evidence that POTUS is a criminal and broke the law. But the Dems don't even want to talk about impeachment until more evidence surfaces. And I would just have to ask, more evidence of what? This failure of a president is dismantling environmental protections daily, ruining US credibility with the rest of the world even more daily. He's acting in the best interests of Russia for an unknown but suspected yet unproven reason. He admits to sexual assault. We have proof that he's had affairs, so much for Republican family values. His tax policies have added up to $2.3 trillion to the national debt, so much for Republican fiscal conservatism. But that's not all. Now they're coming after your Social Security and Medicare. You know, those socialist programs that you've been paying into your entire working life. The most popular American government programs out there in order to cover the deficit let's left by tax cuts that only benefit the top 1%. So much for caring about the middle class. Hey, Republicans and independents that voted for Trump, do you feel like a fucking idiot yet? Look in the mirror. You really should. But as bad as Trump's admitted sexual assaults and infidelities are, a new report came out that rocks even that corrupt foundation. Yes, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church and the more than a thousand children that were assaulted and raped by over 300 priests over 70 years. And that's only in Pennsylvania. Now, given an outraged stick and asked to shake it at all the assault victims equally, and I have to admit, I can't. The abuse and rape of children by Catholic priests has been a problem from the beginning of this corrupt, illogical, and vile religious institution. These are the followers of Christ, and these are their appetites. Complain and argue all you like, but there is no institution that has committed crimes at this level in the history of, well, modern history. And no feeding homeless does not make up for decades of institutional cover-up, hate speech, abuse, and rape, no matter how much you like Christmas. So can we please stop pretending that all crimes are equal and by the Pope saying that they're shocked and sorry for the actions of their church members, their comrades, their brothers of the cloth. And just admit that this institution has never worked, has never been about love and compassion, has always been, I'm sorry, has never been good by anyone's standard in any sense of the word. I'm actually surprised the idiot in chief hasn't tried to appear clean by comparison. Yes, I grabbed the women by the pussy and walked in on those underage pageant contestants while they were dressing, but I didn't wear a robe while I did it. That was my shitty Trump. <laughs> really shitty. So, religion. It's all fucked, right? It's all fucked, but we really should protect it. Protect it from vile naysayers, naysayers and atheists. Why not create a special task force? To uphold its holy rights, to belittle, condemn, persecute, restrict rights, and attack the non-religious, or at least those of lower moral value, as judged by the xenophobic, bigoted religious themselves. That happens to be the very topic for tonight. The United States' brand new Religious Liberty Task Force. I am being joined by two of the brightest minds available to discuss it as well. Our first guest is one of my favorite witches in the world. She has an MA in Religious Studies and is a PhD candidate. Her focus is on Western esotericism, religion, and ritual, popular culture. She has received multiple awards and scholarships and has been uh, had her research published in academic journals and books. She was a contributor to Nine Cents with her unorthodoxy segment and has been a frequent guest on Speak of the Devil. Allow me to introduce the very beautiful Witch Zaftig. How are you, my dear? I'm well. How are you? Very good. We're also being joined by an editorialist that has worked both in print and online as an agent provocateur. His unbiased and unflinching look at any situation can endear his 
brutal honesty to you or repulse you outright. Though you probably know him best as a working musician, traveling the world's countries, bringing back his original delivery of the blues, and more recently, his macabre musical project, The Wedding Funeral. Please welcome Darren Deicide. How are you, my friend? First, let me say that you're... I thought your imitation of Trump was terrific. <laughs> it was bigly. So good. So good. Huge, huge tremendous. <laughs> Both of yours is so much better than mine. <laughs> I was like leaning on like almost a Jersey thing. And you guys are just... <laughs> You know, over. now I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let me come on back here to all the people in the chat room and give a quick shout out. Wes, my man, great to see you. CJ, thanks for joining us live. Robbie Vandervelde, did I say it right? Thanks for joining us, man. Cardone, <laughs> my man in New York City. How you doing? Uh, who else we got here? Uh, Joaquin, great to see you, my friend. Stephanie, how are you, my dear? Uh, Valeria, Valeria, Val. Val yeah, V, how you doing, dear? Uh, Tyler, great to see you. Robert, uh, Elijah, my man, how are you? Benjamin, dog's my co-pilot. It's been a while. Good to see you joining us. David Fewer Pie, how are you, man? Robbie Vandervelde, I already said your name, and I just want to say it again because it's a lot of fun. It's like salsa. Salsa. Velda. <laughs> anyway, Ronnie, thanks for joining us. Michael, David, good to see you. Dr. Bubonic, yeah, I feel a little sick, too. Uh, Chaotic Scott. Is that everyone? Fucking hell. Mr. Victor. Thanks, man. Uh, Melissa, good to see you, my dear. And uh, for everyone who joins in after the fact, after we started and everything, uh, thank you guys so much. If you have any questions or comments, put them on up there. I'm going to try to get to them all. But this is a hell of a discussion we're about to have. So please be patient if we don't get to it immediately. All right. Uh, which is acting? Monsieur Deicide. Mm. Where the fuck are we going to start with this thing? <laughs> Can, can, can we start from the very beginning and, and sort of just right. frame? Okay, so let me let me give you my initial uh, ideas, at least to sort of spark the discussion of where Sessions is, is positioning himself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, let's talk about the worldview of a person like Jeff Sessions. So he is not alone. He's not doesn't exist in a vacuum. He actually uh, inherits a very long uh, tradition from the foundation of America. So when they write the Constitution and free speech, they did not conceive an of an America that had citizens of pagan and atheistic or secularist types of worldviews. Uh, what the freedom of speech notion for religious freedom meant in the Constitution was to prevent warring factions of different Christianities from establishing one form of Christianity as more important than the other. So essentially, when they're protecting religious freedom, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about Christianity. Now, over the centuries and different legal battles, they then extend this and interpret it to mean that all religions have that particular freedom, separation of church and state. But Sessions is a group of uh, conservatives that has always resented this notion that it would extend to other religions because they've always understood it as free speech is only for Christians and it's the moral majority. Um, if you've ever heard the uh, phrase of American exceptionalism, as most mm -hmm. people have, it's actually based on uh, Calvin. Yeah. Uh, it's actually based on uh, Calvin, a theologian. So a theologian who came from Europe, but his idea was. Uh, if you are blessed uh, and you're successful and you're wealthy and powerful, it's because God deemed it. Obviously, it's predestined. So anytime uh, you achieve success, it's because God has made you one of his chosen persons. So, so when America has success, economic, political, militaristic success, it becomes interpreted as a notion of divine right. And so th in this particular worldview, America is the new Jerusalem. This is the new frontier for the spread of Christianity. So it's not this thing that that when secularists and Satanists and pagan and all kinds of people find this so bizarre and backward, in in Sessions' worldview, it's because they've lost something by granting all these rights and protections to non-Christians. They've actually lost the divine protection of God and his blessing. So when then they, in that worldview, when there are problems, epidemics, and they, just like uh, some of the craziest things we've ever heard of blaming uh, gays uh, for the cause of hurricanes or <laughs> gay marriage means that natural disasters happen, in that worldview, it's rational. It makes sense. How else would you explain that? 
Because if you're meant, if you're the New Jerusalem, and something terrible happens to America, it means you've pissed off God. Yeah. This is the entire religious text. So this is how it, this is how where it's coming from. And when he implements this task force, even if he mentions protections in the brief that where the the speech that he gives, uh, he mentions that they have filed briefs on behalf of other religions like uh, Islam, Hinduism, and Judaism. Mm. Uh, I don't think anybody's fully convinced that that w that's not anything but mild lip service to demonstrate that they're equal opportunity um, uh, <laughs> protections. Right. What they really want is to establish Christianity as the moral authority that supersedes. Like and he's he said in previous speeches and the and in all kinds of notions that the idea that your your relationship with God as a citizen in America is primary over the laws of the land, and so that they are pushing this narrative, and that one of the reasons that they completely ignored everything that Trump does is because he's responding to this inner anger and fear. Like when he goes on these um, tours and he pounds the podium and makes all these ridiculous, inane statements that don't make any sense. And everyone else says, how could you listen to this man and, and believe him or make a, a, or think he makes any sense or isn't, or isn't a total fucking idiot? Uh, I think that the religious background, my religious background of, of understanding the display mm -hmm. He's performing their anger for them. He's when he stands there and says, "Oh yes, you know, like uh, uh, when he makes all those racist comments, it's because he's responding to the anger of uh, white America that feels that non-whites don't know their place anymore." He's when he's responding to when he sort of pounds the podium and says, "We'll say Merry Christmas again." He's <laughs> he's tapping into that primal fear of Christians of feeling like, "Oh, we're losing our nation." Right. So th that's what's happening. So his personal actions in his life are irrelevant because they feel someone who's res who's confirming what they uh, believe to be wrong with the world. So he's, yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. Non-whites don't know their place. Yes, you're right. Christianity is failing. Yeah. So it's a it's a display of their primal fear. And they're responding that to that more than anything else. And once you sort of understand that, you get to understand more Trumpism, even among people who are not religious. Because if they have, if they wa want whites to be supremacists and he displays that, then they're like, I don't care if he's an idiot. Uh, he's he's gonna implement things that I feel are correct and right. Well, that, thank you guys for coming to the show. <laughs> that pretty much <laughs> clarifies everything. Um, have a good yeah. night, tip your waiter. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Darren, let me ask you because <laughs> no, don't leave yet. Um, is I understand the, the the worldview that which Zapti just covered. Do you is it is it even rational in our modern society to still hold on to that type of a worldview when we have uh, hundreds of years of I mean progress? I mean some progress. Yeah. Well, I mean, I generally agree with. Uh, Simony's narrative there about what uh, Jeff Sessions comes from. Um, Jeff Sessions is attorney general from Alabama. Alabama statistically is about 85% Christian and of that uh, self-identified Christian uh, about 50% of that is uh, evangelical Protestant. And they hold, if you look at there's really interesting polls on this sort of stuff, Gallup and Pew, they do all sorts of uh, interesting polls where they ask people in America questions and you find out that American views are just <laughs> fucking Mars on some of this stuff. Um, in particular, things like uh, uh, belief in miracles or the afterlife or creationist views. Um, you know, there's like a third of the American population thinks that the world exists now as it did 5,000 years ago when it was created. So real bonker stuff. And this, this sort of worldview was created and is part of a general fabric that has its roots in the Puritan side of things. And the Puritans were extreme radicals. Mm. It's something that America sort of romanticized what they are. You know, we like to doodle paintings of, of Indians and pilgrims at yeah, a Only table around Thanksgiving, I think. Together. <laughs> What's that? Only around Thanksgiving, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if you uh, ask an Indian from the time what their view was on that whole thing, they'd have a very different answer for you. The uh, the, the views of the 
Massachusetts Bay Colony were uh, were extremely uh, uh, radical. Mm -hmm. um, they, if you look at the seal of Massachusetts, uh, which is named after the Massachusetts tribe of people, uh, you see a Massachusetts Indian. Um, but since since the the time of the colonies, uh, they've taken this out. <laughs> This sort of sensibility has prevailed, but originally there used to be a, uh, a banner coming out of an Indian's mouth on the seal, and it said, come over here and help us. Uh, and it's very indicative of the attitude. Okay, I didn't know that. That's, oh, I'm yeah, laughing because that's tragic. Oh, gosh. Oh, that's so right. But it is connected to this idea of exceptionalism, this idea that uh, the the Puritans had that they held the keys to superior civilizing values that really the rest of the world were just yearning for, and that all they needed was the freedom to come here and start their grand experiment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the people who are more of the architects of our constitution and whatnot, uh, they were kind of in a precarious position, and most of them were deists. Um, they, they, which I, I'm going to presume if you tuned in, you're not a complete idiot. So I'm not going to go into too much of what a deist is. It's sort of like the, the, the indifferent engineer who like, you know, pushed a train down a track and said, go. Um, I thought it was the but, deist side fan club. <laughs> I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> I'm waiting for that anytime now, people. <laughs> Darren is the grand architect of all things. Really what that means. Yeah. And I am done. <laughs> <laughs> I go off camera. <laughs> but no, I mean, this, this, these people, they had views where the, if you look at the documentation, you know, uh, like during the Pequot War, uh, the Mystic Massacre, where Captain John Mason wrote this scathing thing about how, uh, you know, the, the Indians that were massacred deserved it because they were heathens and it was the Lord God's judgment. Uh, this is very typical of the views. And then, you know, of course, they, they went ahead and threw the survivors of, of the tribe into concentration camps and sold them into slavery. So they had this, this very uh, divine providence point of view that is shared now by what are these modern evangelical extremists who are body politic now mm -hmm. uh, that are sort of ensconced in the GOP. Um, we don't know for sure whether the GOP actually cares, sincerely cares about their views. Uh, my, my suspicion is that they, they don't. They, that they don't. Mm -hmm. um, my suspicion is that they are savvy enough to know that if they... It, give lip service to certain things that are not that meaningful. You know, you have them bicker about prayer in school or Ten Commandments, uh, uh, landmarks, or you, you just get them involved in something like that. And then they kind of get out of the way and they get away from like the important special interests that they're really interested in. Mm -hmm. And as long as those people are fighting, and race works really well in this category too. So as long as they could keep doing that, they can keep cashing the checks and, you know, continuing on with their special interest of subsidizing the, the military industry and keeping an unsustainable, ener non-renewable energy infrastructure going. And that's really what, where all those people come from if you look at their backgrounds. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting to me because the um, I, I sort of want to jump over to the the First Amendment of the Constitution through the lens that um, which uh, Zaptig has uh, painted because I, I never really thought of it in the terms of these were Protestants and Catholics trying to find a way or Presbyterians primarily and, and Catholics trying to find a way to get along through this religious freedom line. I, I mean, you know, obviously we typically as people look back on things with rose colored glasses and I sort of had this ignorant stance of saying, yes, I understand that these people come from a religious background and some of them may even ascribe to this religion themselves, but they were perhaps more awakened than they really were, you know, and that's just our own foolish modern sensibilities being projected on these individuals and sort of deifying them. Um, but I, so I want to, I want to read out really quick the first amendment. So everyone understands the, the founding principle of this. And then I would like everyone to sort of reflect on that in the term of how we, 
how we see it today versus maybe how it was originally perceived because I do think that there's a slight difference and I, I want to hear what you guys think if there is still or not. So Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press and then it continues on through peaceable assembly and uh, petition to government for redress of grievances. Um, and you had mentioned with Zaftig that uh, even though there is a, a more modern interpretation of this by a large portion of the United States populace, that there is a subsection, you know, these evangelicals, the Jeff Sessions of the world, that still very much do not see it through that modern lens. Um, and it, it has a resurgence. So I think that the, the Founding Fathers, I'm not sure, so I'm not a constitutional scholar, right. but I, I do actually tend to believe that many of the Founding Fathers uh, uh, as Darren mentions, um, weren't uh, terribly concerned with Christianity in the same way that the voting population was. Mm -hmm. So when they're trying to make the peace between the, the all the warring uh, factions of Christianity, um, they're still they're still sort of hoping for um, a relatively secular or at least secular for the time government. Right, so the, the idea, like, of course, people are going to live religiously because that's ninety nine point percent of the you know the population at the time, uh, but they're still sort of conceiving of a government that isn't involved in religion. But what Sessions uh, has done here, uh, so there's a previous mandate from a year ago. So I was looking at some of the things that maybe actually have been written. So there's this religious task force, but then there was actually this uh, document called um, I have to look it up, the Religious Freedom Restoration. Right. So he's in the U.S. code. So he's and they're talking about this idea that um, if a government uh, mandates that uh, a person of faith does can, cannot exercise their faith and by exercising, they mean denying someone there, <laughs> like denying someone there, making a cake, let's just say, yeah. or marrying them, um, uh, that that places an undue burden on the religious person. And then it is thus discrimination. But what this means is. It's uh, this, this, they're calling it a burden. That's the quote that's used. Um, they're using it much more broadly. It would mean that protections against, against discrimination uh, gets turned into an affirmative right to discriminate. So that they're flipping the script on what that means. So this idea that if someone else is exercising their right, a gay couple wants to get married because mm -hmm. um, it's perfectly legal after, well, the United States was way behind the rest of the uh, modern world of that, but it is still on the books <laughs> for the moment. Um, but that uh, it would be a burden on the clerk to issue the marriage license. It's a burden on the pharmacist to give uh, birth control if she doesn't believe in premarital sex. Mm -hmm. It's a burden on them. So this is how they're interpreting it. Like that it's a, it, they're, if it's a, it, it's a right to discriminate, but they're not using discriminations, they're flipping the script and they're using this word. And that it's, if it's government interference. So if the government says that I'm mandated to prescribe birth control, then how that violates their free speech. Right. So it's legally, it actually does fall in, I, I mean, into this slightly murky category and they can get away with it because they have all this support among all the people who make policy, which would be the GOP. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to say, just add that the, a lot of the Democrats pay that same kind of lip service to uh, religious adherents all the time. Oh, yeah. They're not introducing laws the same way that the GOP has consistently introduced religious laws, even if they got struck down mm -hmm. um, in order sometimes to appease their voting public. But they're, none of them are saying, I reject the concept entirely. Uh, I'm not even religious. Uh, I want to I want to just make the best laws and represent my county or whatever it is the best as possible. Even Democrats aren't doing that. So they mm -hmm. play that same kind of game. It's yeah. not a solely GOP thing. Even if more and more, I do think in the GOP, you do have a few more uh, religious uh, fervor, <laughs> but like a sincerely uh, religious people that are like the, the Tea Party that are absolutely trying to push forward um, Christian morality as legal policy in the United States. Yeah. Right. The, re the Religious Freedom Restoration Act actually on a federal level started during the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. um, since then, uh, there's okay. been some, some cases, I think it was a uh, city of Bourne versus uh, Flores where there was this uh, 
it's a question of a church being able to to defy uh, city ordinances on some building permits something that you wouldn't think of would be <laughs> would be set as a legal precedent but then it was deferred to the states and now the states are starting to draw legal lines but I uh, but what they're actually looking for is to shift the burden this is sort of an Orwellian play going on I agree with uh with which Safdig on this one um that uh what they're what if you actually look at it and you just don't go with the rhetorical flourishes you find out that what they're looking for are exemptions from the law mm -hmm. and the exemptions from the law that should meet a heavy burden of proof because we're they, presumably at least in law philosophy <laughs> uh, the law is supposed to be there to ensure that that uh you know justice is done and that uh via that uh, that uh, social contracts stay together so it would it would should meet a very heavy burden of proof uh, to to reach that sort of exemption but as far as a in, in most cases where the religious freedom restoration act seems to be coming into play it seems to be coming into play with particular touchstone issues mm. uh, like same-sex marriage mm. or health care issues um, mm. and in those cases actually if you do look at the civil rights acts that exist, uh, you actually don't see too many protections there. The, most of those civil rights acts are dealing with race. Um, they're dealing with religion. So this is new battleground, and mm -hmm. that's yeah. why it's becoming such an issue. There's more precedent in international institutions. Uh, and b by the way, this isn't like a particularly unique thing in America. That uh, in general. Uh, gay communities and transgender communities are very unprotected in most states. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's not unique, but uh, you do see more protections, at least more ostensibly more protections coming from international bodies like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the UN. And it's very interesting, by the way, to note that the, the opposition that came towards the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a similar argument that's being made for the type of religious freedom bills we're seeing now, but it came from Saudi Arabia, who then convened a separate convention called the Cairo Declaration of uh, Human Rights, in which you, you look at it and it's just a, a, a set of exemptions in order for theocratic states to exist, for Sharia law. So there's an interesting parallel there because religious extremism kind of has a similarity in both ways. Yeah, I don't think I don't think there's anything mutually exclusive about uh, American religion, religious identity or expressions. I mean, it's you, you start from a totalitarian mindset of this single individual passing judgment. It's hard to divorce the rest of your reality from that if that's your moral center as a human being. Um, and when I was looking at stuff like this, whether it was refusal to bake a cake or um, a refusal to marry someone or, you know, w whatever these um, restrictions uh, these individuals are, are withholding from these groups on religious grounds, the only thing that I can come up with as a legal statute would be freedom of speech. Like, because I don't know what else would fall under that protection like you're you're oppressing my religion and so as a as a state you are forcing me to go against you know you're forcing my private business to do on behalf of an outside force which doesn't on its face seem like it should make sense um except that you know but when it is private business a religion this is this is where I always interject, a private business, privately owned, or even mm -hmm. a publicly owned one, isn't a person. So when we have, when they make, uh, when they make corporations people, yeah. th that's, it's with the intent of doing this kind of thing. So if you own a business and it, you practice a particular religion, um, nothing prevents you from a personal practice. Mm -hmm. And in Jeff Sessions' speech, he says, religion doesn't end at the church door. This is, uh, he's, he's directly addressing this notion that it's not solely a private thing, that it should be public and of the concern of the government. Mm -hmm. So my thing is always, uh, your business isn't actually a person and it doesn't grant the right to discriminate because you have to do all kinds of other things then and then where is that line then of religion uh, a 
quote unquote oppression. Um, mm. It's not oppressive. It would be oppressive if I forced you to marry and fuck a guy. It's not oppressive if I say, sell me a coffee, sell or a cake to like gay men. Like if it's not a practice, that's your business. Right. So to me, the idea that they're conflating these things, or when he says they forces nuns to buy contraception. Well, the nuns aren't buying contraception. They are providing health care benefits to employees, some of which are female and some of which require health care that includes contraceptive, as most modern women do in order to plan their lives accordingly and to live the lives that they want. And I think that's the most offensive thing to that kind of worldview, that the idea that women could go about entirely independent and unconcerned with the whims of the church. <laughs> they can, <laughs> they can sleep what they want to, they can uh, plan and control their lives, they can be engaged in public life. And one of the underlying things of denying women contraception, whether it's abortion or the pill, mm -hmm. is that it, it prevents them from participating in public life. Because if you cannot plan your pregnancies, you are relegated much more to the home. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, a fact of <laughs> most women bear the burden of the more childcare. So when that happens, it's this deliberate notion of, 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 denying women to be able to get more degrees, uh, have more professional lives, uh, be able to control what's happening. And that's something that in this Christian patriarchal evangelical view, um, they find abhorrent. Even as many of these evangelical women work, they work very hard, they have jobs, they raise their kids, they, they juggle things like a lot of other women do. Uh, but ultimately, they also defer to men in a particular way because they they in, in a way that secular women refuse to uh, so there's also that kind of battle happening where this notion that that when he says nuns have to buy contraception he's being disingenuous he knows then the nuns aren't taking it and unless some of them are uh, but it's the <laughs> idea that the corporation somehow re reflects this and has a say in individual employees health care right which i just find i'm I don't know. As a Canadian <laughs> with our healthcare system, the idea that your employer could have a say in that kind of thing, uh, it would just the uproar, even among some religious groups, right. would be far too loud to ever let it happen. So it's like you have no say. The physicians have a say. That's it. Right. There's I mean, no it's and it's not. It's not in a say as in you can or can't do it. It's in a say. It's a say as in whether or not they're willing to afford it. And so that would be their argument, saying, "I'm sorry, uh, provide it for you." Like you can get it on your own. You don't need us to give it for you. And that Sessions' argument yeah. is that you know they're they're leaning and forcing sure. these religious yeah. institutions or other organizations with a religious bent to them by their owners, um, you know, to do something that is against their own belief system. And uh, though I stand with you in the absurdity of that idea, we do mm -hmm. also have to recall back to you know as you've said a couple of times that is their worldview. And so yeah. we, we have to sort of rationalize at some point or, or make a decision culturally at some point. Are that's we going to, I'm sorry? Yeah, that's, uh, well, that's because of the federal funding issues and the sort of like intertwined gray area between insurance and healthcare. Right. Uh, in the, that's, uh, and it does have this effect of, of sort of putting people in a second class citizen sort of, uh, position mm -hmm. uh but as far as like you know uh, businesses I, i'm i'm gonna kind of have my own opinion on this one. i mean my opinion is, is. is that if if you know if you don't want to bake a cake for a gay couple then you know fine be a schmuck and lose the business and you know let the gay couple go find another business if you don't want to uh, perform the abortion as a nurse because it goes against your religious view stay home and be broke that's fine we'll find somebody else to do it as far as i i, I generally think free association can work as a, as an idea there but when it comes to issues where the state is more closely involved uh, and, and it does appear in issues of like federal funding. Actually, Jeff Sessions was part of a landmark case because he was sued by um, a, a gay uh, student organization, the Gay Lesbian Bisexual Alliance um, at the University of Alabama, um, because they were denied federal funds 
and they were denied federal funds because of sodomy laws in Alabama. Cool. And the argument was that the uh, that the sodomy laws, since uh, they weren't supported, uh, they were essentially engaging in criminal behavior that therefore the University of Alabama being a federally funded school uh, was not obligated to give them any of the funds that they would that any other organization would get, mm -hmm. which relegates them to a second class sort of position. And that's a case where there's a, a very, uh, very hard argument to make. And, and by the way, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court of Alabama sided with Sessions on that one. So they were denied federal funding. So this is this. It's really up to those targeted communities to decide whether or not they're going to allow themselves to be relegated to this sort of position. And this is where the vigilance comes in and the the uh, sort of outspokenness. But th this is like my fundamental misunderstanding of all this, and I'm hoping someone here um, can clarify this for me, because I understand the idea that an individual business owner wants to have the right to refuse business from anyone. But we had an entire civil rights movement to prevent that from happening. You can't discriminate because of uh, someone's ethnicity or the color of their skin. And I would imagine that that would extend to um, race, religion, physical status, sexuality, gender identity, like, that's what civil rights is all about, is that it, it doesn't matter if you as an individual business man or woman, better or worse for the future of your business, decides to discriminate in any form for any reason. The fact is the state says, no, you can't. And that's to protect the minority. Like, is that is the case, isn't it? Well, not now. <laughs> because we have these religious freedom bills. <laughs> okay, very good point. I was just, I'm just trying to establish like the, because that is a common argument I hear about other people, um, that other people share. And it's one that on the surface, I totally agree with too. Like you should have the right to refuse anyone, except for when that person, it, it, it's no, because okay, of a bigoted view. This is, this is my Canadianness. Like that's such an American idea. Like yeah. that, that's this idea that, oh, this is my castle. It's it's a it's sort of an extension of the of you know the king, you're the king of the castle kind of this is my business. This is my diner, hair you know hairdresser shop, cake mm. shop, whatever it is. And that's one business, by the way, people. Here, <laughs> yes, and anyone who steps in here is somehow subject to my rule because I'm the king. Mm. Except for there's all kinds of things that are illegal. You're not allowed to not pay employees. You're not allowed to not give them a break. You're not allowed to exploit them in particular ways. We have all kinds of things that the government interferes with in your business. You're not allowed to not you pay taxes. don't have those either. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Kind of notion of you're not allowed to not you know you're not allowed to have them dig coal for 20 hours a day. Um, the the there's child labor laws. So there's all kinds of laws already in in a business that that the average American business owner adheres to. So the idea then to me that because they're not talking about infringement of right, what they're really talking about is they're personally offended by a customer's lifestyle. And then to me then that's. Uh, that crosses the line. Yeah, refuse business to the person who's uh, rude and uh, doesn't, you know, rude to your staff or is doesn't lo lo tip or no um, shirt, no shoes. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, dressed or behaving inappropriately. Absolutely, but but by but by then saying that they're allowed to refuse business uh, based on those other grounds, like of civil rights, that as you say, we've. We fought for, marched for, mm -hmm. that were fought in the courts for, uh, you know, whites being able to sit next to blacks, uh, not having separate bathrooms and water fountains. It wasn't yeah. that long well, ago in the United sir. States, those laws were on the books. So to me, that they, that were somehow creeping back towards that, and no one seems to think that that's uh, a terrible idea. I think a, uh, I think a lot of people do, I think. Let me, let me be clear, though. I, let me just be clear that when I when I made that statement, I was speaking not as a matter of principle, but like as just a matter of stratagem. Um, I think I think though that it's for one thing. I don't belong to some of these groups, so I can't really say what the best uh, course of action is. Like I know gay people who are utterly opposed to the entire institution of marriage, 
and see it as a heteronormative imposition on the way that they do things. So it's really up to those communities to decide whether they want to even be a part of those institutions. And I'm not really in a position to say that. Um, I think as a matter of principle, I totally agree with you. Um, I, I, I don't think it should uh, uh, that people should sort of have these arbitrary antiquated views on discrimination. I think if they discriminate, it should be merited, as he put it, like somebody's rude in your business and you kick that motherfucker out. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, it's not it's not imminent domain. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's that's going to be up to the people who are at the brunt of this, where how they want to relate to it all. Yeah. Um, and so uh, do I think they should be subjected to this? No. Um, but that's uh, yeah, again, it's really up to them. I want to, uh, we're like 40 minutes in and we haven't even directly referenced <laughs> like the Religious Liberty Task Force <laughs> itself yet. So I want to <laughs> pivot to that. Um, I have an enlightened perspective from Patrick DeMarco. Uh, let's watch that on the other side of it. Let's, let's dive into this thing, you know, this Religious Liberty Task Force. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Patrick DeMarco and it's time for another enlightened perspective. So this Religious uh, Task Force that Trump is pushing through, that we're going to protect the people's religious freedoms, um, I think is just to further Christian uh, agenda. I think that he's saying that, oh, we're going to protect this, we're going to protect that, but what religions are they going to protect? Is it all of them? Is it just a few of them? Um, I don't believe that we need a task force to protect people's religious freedoms. And if that is a case, that people's religious freedoms are being persecuted, that's a whole nother conversation. I don't think a task force is necessary, especially since these religions don't pay taxes, except for the Church of Satan. Um, if we're gonna be funding a, a, a force to protect religious freedoms, I think they should pay their fair share. I think this is just a matter of subterfuge that he's pushing the Christian agenda and he's gonna protect it and it alone. Is it for Jewish people? Is it for Muslims? Is it for everybody? This is completely unnecessary and i think that it's pushing more like i said before of his christian agenda dogma to further you know push what he wants to have done in, in a moral compass that he doesn't really believe in in the first place so i think it's just uh, absolute atrocious that we're even having the conversation about a religious task force or to have a uh, to protect people's religious freedoms. That's already accepted. And then to put more money into it, I think there's something going on that uh, needs to be addressed. And that's your enlightened perspective. So there's a, a couple things that I want to touch on that he, he had okay. mentioned. Before you get into this, I didn't hear a word of that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm that's sure why I wanted to watch, have you watch it beforehand. <laughs> yes, my slacker ass also did not watch it beforehand. So um, I'm sure it was huge, but uh, I might need to- It was bigly. <laughs> um, well, let me say, he, he brought up a really interesting idea about the bureaucracy side of it, um, saying this is going to create, I, I mean, th this is me reading into what he was saying, this is going to create a brand new bureaucracy that is going to cost taxpayers a lot of money in order to protect a non-tax paying idea or you know this this idea of these organizations that, that don't contribute but then they're going to be protected by those of us who don't even want to have this unnecessary thing in the first place and i thought the bureaucracy side of it was really interesting because that's what we're seeing you know with the space force creating a brand new unnecessary bureaucracy in this government at, at what point are we just going to look at the absurdity of all of this and say look aren't you guys supposed to be the ones like watching the dollar like, why are you so willing to just spend it if like, it doesn't make any government sense? government be without wasting money? I mean, really, yeah. come on. That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> um, so I want to start with the reason why. Why does Jeff Sessions and those that are backing this think that this is a good idea? And so I pulled out some quotes um, for you know, the sort of the, the cause that he thinks uh, exists right now. And hopefully we can just have a, a back and forth about, you know, how absurd is it rational? Are there points there that we should consider about this? So let me, let me burn through this really quick. A dangerous movement undetected by many is now challenging and eroding our great tradition of religious freedom. There can be no doubt. This is no little matter. 
It must be confronted and defeated. This election, and much that has flowed from it, gives us a rare opportunity to arrest these trends. Such a reversal will not just be done with electoral victories, but by intellectual victories. We have gotten to the point where courts have held that morality cannot be a basis for law, where ministries are fearful to affirm, as they understand it, holy writ from the pulpit, and where one group can actively target religious groups by labeling, labeling them a hate group on the basis of their sincerely held religious beliefs. So that's, that's why he thinks it's important to have something like this. What is this dangerous movement undetected by many that he's referring to? Civil rights. <laughs> well, also, also just I, I mean, cre creeping atheism, really. I mean, the, their point of view, the, the, the entire foundation of what they, their worldview is really falling apart. It's kind of like if you look at like a lot of the angry white men stuff going on in America right now. I mean, it, as a demographic, white men are shrinking. So there is actually like the, the entire appeal of this administration is to groups of people who feel like they've been ignored and marginalized and their backs are against the wall. Yeah. Um, but the truth is, is they're not. I mean, this like eroding religious tradition is still, despite the fact that atheism is sort of on a rise and you do see statistically that the, that there's a slope of sorts. Globally, it's massively atheism. on the rise. What's that? Globally, we, it's massively on a rise, isn't it? Uh, I was just—I was talking about uh, the belief in God or like theistic right. views. Slowly, in in America, it's right. slowly on, on a downward slope. Um, but it's still like if you poll America, over eighty percent of the population believes in a divine entity called God. Hmm. So it's it's not it's, it's it's sort of the last gasps of of a declining view. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so here's I mean, yes and no. So here's I I think that there's certainly a younger generation that is part of what um, well what scholars call the nuns, like not particularly associated with um, uh, an institutionalized religion. Uh, however, uh, you do see very few of them are uh, uh, identifying as atheists. I mean, some are, and that's certainly growing, as it as you say. Uh, but there's I tend to view a lot of it as this new agey kind of thought that they're still sort of talking about spirit and all that stuff. Right. So it's shifting. Mm -hmm. But 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 when the proverbial Christian straight white guy uh, gets angry and talks about oppression, uh, he's not actually being oppressed. Uh, what's happening is more that other people's rights and ideas and and dignity are being considered alongside, and that is interpreted as oppression. So that when the Christians say, I'm being oppressed, it's not, it's not actual oppression. It's more that then other people's ideas are being considered in equal measure, and they interpret it that way. And that becomes this contentious point of it, trying to convince people, you're not actually being oppressed. What's happening is you can no longer claim supremacy. You know, white people aren't oppressed at all. Like, the idea is laughable to me. Uh, we are just considering people, others. <laughs> we are considering that maybe the worldview of white people and the privileges that come with it, that you've sort of assumed and walked through life and never really thought about it until other people are, are sort of drawing attention to it. And mm -hmm. then the reaction is uh, a negative one. Like, how dare you say that to me? Especially among the poor whites. Like, I know I grew up in that kind of... Uh, me too. Yeah. White awful poor had no plumbing and electricity uh in some places and sometimes uh, and so the idea that that you that someone from a poor white background would think that they have privileges is unheard of to them so they don't quite understand it uh instead of saying no one's saying that everyone who's white has an easy go of it absolutely not they're saying that the obstacles you face are not based on your skin mm -hmm. Whereas someone, the not, a non-white person, will have more obstacles based on skin and the way people react to them, the way people don't hire them, and there's all this notion of, um, of, especially white people saying, "Well, I'm not racist. I'm not a KKK. I don't believe in white supremacy. I'm not a Nazi." And the rhetoric is, it's not about people being so overt. 
because so often it's just sort of assumed you tend to, if you're white, you tend to hire other white people and you don't think you're racist when you do that versus considering an actual person's uh, qualities and considerations because you feel more comfortable around people around, around your own kind. And there's so many studies that back up this notion of like, like attracts like that you don't really consider yourself um, as exhibiting um, that type of uh, discriminatory practice. So to, to make people more aware of it, then they get defensive and they interpret it as, oh, I'm being oppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. there's no, there's no uh, oppression in that. It just means you're uncomfortable. You're not oppressed. You're uncomfortable with ideas that may be um, challenged how you perceive of yourself. Yeah. I, 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 I generally agree with you, but there, there are sectors of poor white communities in America, post-industrial towns, where that, it, these sort of people have their appeal, and that's where their appeal is being made to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's, it's classic divide and conquer sort of stuff, yeah. because really, at, you know, we kind of touched on it earlier, I don't think these people care. I really don't think <laughs> they do. <laughs> but you know you it's much easier it, this, this is also very well pulled in america right now there's a very deep sense of desperation in the working class um and when it when you have generally people are pretty unhappy especially in in these sort of post-industrial uh, towns they did a poll and they asked americans whether they felt that they were happy or that they had a, like a meaningful life and you see throughout america something that was called the misery belt um, and it's generally cutting through like Ohio and uh, some of the Midwest. And it's, it's just generally like areas where infrastructure has just completely crumbled. And there's not really uh, now that we've sort of moved into a globalized economy and uh, things have moved in more into the uh, service sector as opposed to the manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. uh, you have these people who really just don't know um what the source of all of this is and uh people like uh donald trump when they talk about nafta are hitting a bell because yeah. they do remember when the free trade agreement sent all the jobs away and they did watch their town fall apart um yeah. and those people are a demographic mm -hmm. uh, i don't think that 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 interest has to come into conflict with other people in the working class mm -hmm. um but uh, that's that's where they they make yeah. their people. But then instead of uh, actually looking at Trump's policies that only cater to his billionaire friends, right, right. The, the, <laughs> so so I, I agree with you. The the grievances are absolutely legitimate. Like the middle the middle class gets eroded. Uh, the poor working class get shit on all over. Their numbers increase. It's just it becomes almost past the point of no return. And when they see the, you know, Trump thumping on a podium and blaming the immigrants and all the and feminists and wh whoever he likes to blame, they respond to that. You're, mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely uh, correct. Uh, and the shitty thing is, it's not as if Democrats had plans to help them either. No. So even oh, yeah. if, well, even if I, I mean, they did. Despise, but... um, like <laughs> whether or not, yeah, there's plans, but not active like cross the board type of plans, he's certainly going to make it entirely a hundred times worse. But but even Hillary or even not Hillary, even Obama, like, yes, there's lots of ideas of trying to help. But in terms of being able to execute those things and being able to not face as much opposition from the GOP, right, right. Um, it's not as if they were signaling to the emotions of, of these people in the same way that Trump does. Like, yeah. they have no clue on how to do that. There's no notion. If I were a billionaire Democrat right now, I would hire PR firms and psychiatrists that, that understood uh, Nazi propaganda. And I'd be like, I want you to do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would do. And I would throw money at it. I'd be like, I need you to, I want you to tap into their primal emotions. Yeah. Fuck policy. What do they really want right now? Yeah. And give me an Not ad. Talking to... like an American. <laughs> right, <laughs> seriously. Know, right? <laughs> All right. Let, I, I need to pull back from this because we're we're really going into politics, and I know it's related, and the causation is why we get this result. But I want to try to focus a little harder on on this religious side of it um, as right. we move forward. So, so then, let me just pull out my quote from Sessions' okay. speech. An in, I quote, an individual's relationship to God is a natural right and precedes the existence of the state and is not subject to state control. 
to me, this is ultimately what he's trying to push. Absolutely. The idea that any time a state passes a law or grants rights mm -hmm. to things that he views in conflict um, or then preceding religious right or mm -hmm. God's natural right, as he calls it, then that is a legal abomination. Right. It's wild that that's a rational argument today. Like, it boggles my mind. I understand that if you, if you just never got out of that frame, that you could then live in that world. But I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Did she just mic drop on us? <laughs> she very well may have. She's like, we zap dig out. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about uh, some of the points that he brings up specifically to define uh, the the um, unreasonable tasks or or requests that are being placed upon his type of person that is the true justification behind this. So he defines it as we've seen nuns ordered to buy contraceptives. And we spoke about this earlier. Um, we've seen U S senators ask judicial and executive branch nominees about dogma, which makes perfect sense to me as far as being able to separate church from state. But apparently that's a bridge too far for them. He declares uh, we uh, his support for Trump was because he declares you could say Merry Christmas again, as if for some reason it was banned. This whole made up Fox Bill O'Reilly war on Christmas bullshit that they're still peddling. The Department of Justice has settled 24 cases, civil cases, with 90 plaintiffs regarding the previous administration's wrong application of the contraception mandate to objecting religious employers. Again, that's related to the uh, nun ordering to buy contraceptives, and we discussed that earlier. And then finally, District Court in Columbia issued a permanent injunction in the case involving the Little Sisters of the Poor, a group of nuns who serve the elderly poor. Um, so this is all around the base idea is that you're asking religious people to do things that are outside of their religious ideology. And for them, that is an unreasonable request. But when it's for an atheist to or, or some other absurd pseudo organization to put up whatever stupid monument they want to put up that's not fair that they would have the same rights that i would have so it only extends to their religious identities not to others now i thought it was really interesting that he also brought up this idea that um uh, i think it was jersey um in here that was refusing a mosque to be built I'm trying to like scan through my notes here and find exactly what it was. Um, but it was something like um, a mosque that was constantly rejected to being built. That's not from atheists. That rejection stems from the very Christianity that he's claiming is the, ju yeah. like, the justifiable reason for having this task force in the first place. It's so amazing to me that they, they don't understand the discrimination literally is coming from them toward the very groups that they're saying well, we can't discriminate against uh, Hindus and Islam and... But you're fucking doing it on every fucking turn! Like, how can you not see that you're the one doing it? I've never seen an atheist, like, go to a rally and zig Heil and, and say that the you know, white people are the master race. That's a religious thing. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's... Now you're cutting to the... Well, getting an atheist... I've said this before. Getting atheists to organize is kind of like herding cats. <laughs> Um, Speaking of, they just kind of go into your frame and they say like, "Well, I'm an atheist. I don't really give a this shit." This is my butthole. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Smell he, it. Uh, he wants to. You guys get to know him, so he's. <laughs> but, <showing his> <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's it, it, what you're striking to is this interesting really philosophical discussion about what freedom is hmm. um because it you know we we especially in america we love that f word you know oh we yes love yeah. around yeah freedom fuck yeah um so so we love batting that around and we love talking about how free we are but you know a lot of freedom is a highly conceptual and a highly contextual thing right. as, as what it means to people i mean you know the the, the north korean general doesn't think that he's not free. He thinks he's free. Yeah. 
Um, and that's that's where we have to kind of question our notions of freedom, and we have to question the the notions of freedom that they're putting forth. Right. Uh, whose freedom? What freedom? And what are we talking about? Yeah, it's 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 amazing to me that fame your pussy. <laughs> I need you to lift that fluff a little bit more. He's he's not you know, he's not easily <laughs> Um well can we cover really briefly because as we've already laid out um pretty clearly I think religion the the idea of a Christianity and America has always been commingled, if not mm -hmm. because of the base sense of I personal identity of culture that the founding fathers were raised in, then certainly because of their own personal beliefs, whether they were able to see beyond that and and extend rights to others or not, um, they they were they, you know, they believed in a if not a literal god a natural god this natural order mm -hmm. idea of a god and um you know they they all wrote about it and, and so i just think it's hard for them in in an era that that is the reality to then divorce yourself of that reality without being burned or something like that you know at the stake yeah but i just think that they were influenced by what they had seen in england with the church of england absolutely um, I, yeah. think, I, th I think they absolutely like it wasn't entirely sectarian their motivations um so i think i think there was a, a genuine interest in that but i think also that you know again you go back and you take the romanticism out of it and you find out that a lot of these things did not they didn't view everybody as a citizen they didn't mm -hmm. view every person as a when they said you know that we're all entitled to pursuit of happiness and equality they they really had it only a certain demographic in mind well, it's it's a in a lot of Western nations, the certain demographic was actually in the book who is legally considered a person. Yeah. So, if natives, uh, natives in Canada were not considered legally people for a long time, and the U.S. had similar laws against uh, the slaves, and then um, and e and so even when they strike down these laws, the policies enacted and the attitudes that reflect those policies and ideas uh, live on. I mean, there's still people in Canada today that have a real uh, racist idea about what the Aboriginal population are, and they don't they don't like the idea that they would have rights. Like they, it makes them uncomfortable the idea that they would be considered people alongside them. So when civil rights comes along in various Western nations, what they're really doing is saying, on the laws we're equal. Mm -hmm. Like on on the uh, the access to our resources, the collective resources of this country, the benefits of living here. You know, we're trying to grant you equal access. What you do with them is up to you, but the, we want equal access to these kinds of things where the, the legal category of being a person is extended to all adults. In, in, in various histories of uh, women, especially, that's sort of been the battle at first. Uh, are we legally people? <laughs> then and once you are legally people and recognized with the state, what rights do you have, right to vote, you know, right to um, be independent, all these kinds of things. The thing about America that's interesting to me is that uh, its conservative religious roots have maintained in the way that a lot of other Western nations that also uh, were founded by religious ideals, Canada included, Christian ideals, because mm -hmm. in the West, our basis is, is Christian Christianity, uh, that have moved beyond it. So Norway is Lutheran mostly Christian Lutheran, and even though this is very large uh, section of atheistic or secular, and sort of consider the Lutheran church as their parents' domain. Mm -hmm. But even then, there isn't that same tension or fight between what the newer generation is doing. They all think, oh yeah, it's great that we are moving on. They, the resistance isn't as strong, and you don't see as strong of a backlash. So I find the backlash of American conservative Christianity kind of interesting in its own right, even if it's kind of uh, uh, destructive to many people that I know and makes mm -hmm. me not want to go to the States as much, um, or visit <laughs> my family, right? Uh, the the idea that 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 they've lost something and want to, that they've want to regain by by these ideas. Whereas in Canada, it certainly was there um, in the initial texts and ideas, and there's all there's a massive history of how we uh, treated the natives uh, in terms of wanting to literally kill them out, kidnap them, 
go into residential schools, abuse them, murder them, uh, so that they would it would uh, kill out the native in them, destroy the savage in them. And those Damn. are the texts. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. did some very similar things. Yeah. Uh, so did Australia. And this idea that Canada as a nation, once the Westerners come and colonize it, then belongs to them. So, you know, so even when we have these discussions about what Canada is or what America is, uh, a lot of the indigenous population is always saying, it's a, this is, these are settler ideas in the first place. Yeah. These are colonial ideas in the first place that, that they don't necessarily want uh, to be part of. I mean, some do for all kinds of reasons, but there's this, uh, to me, a notion that even the, the secular nations that have moved beyond and don't, aren't fighting conservative Christianity the same way uh, America is, Canada isn't fighting those same battles. We mm. have a conservative uh, mid, Midwest, uh, but even then, by, by American standards, they're still pretty left. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that our conservative right is still pretty left compared to American conservative right. And this far right, even though it's growing across Western nations, it has its most fervent, its most radical rightness in America. And yeah. just from a historical perspective, I find that kind of interesting, that well, there's sort of the zeitgeist for that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Just to tie the two points that the two of you had brought up just now, um, I think America has unique special interests. And why it is that you have someone like Jeff Sessions coming along and, you know, uh, doing the sort of rhetorical crap that he's doing about freedom of uh, religion, you know, even though they're not even really talking about that, yeah. is because he's trying to make an appeal to <clears throat> and galvanize a certain group of people who actually ideologically have interests that go all over the world in a strange right. way. Um, that, like, for example, like Christian Zionism in America mm-hmm. is a really interesting movement. And it's tied now to evangelical Protestantism in, uh, in the United States. If you look at them, they, they also have bonkers points of view. But one of the interesting ties between Zionism and the American brand of evangelical uh, Christianity is this Calvinistic idea, this idea that, uh, you know, we're, there's a predestination that uh, we, we need to go out and colonize some area, in this case Israel, uh, from the occupied territories uh, that are now being uh, uh, held by these heathens who are savages and don't have any values and, you know, when really it's for their own good that we go ahead and do this. But also, there's this really perverted view in the background that I don't think the people at the top tiers of the GOP actually sincerely believe, but they see the confluent interest in, Mm -hmm. which is that if the Israelis do conquer Palestine, then the Israel then the Israelites have returned to their home and the second coming of Jesus is just around the corner. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It does in that world (laughs) view. Yeah. (laughs) I mean it it really is. And and it's what they're hoping for is the book of revelations. What they're hoping for is an an end times where where we see catastrophe and all of us all of us infidels get our comeuppance yeah. and uh, Jesus comes back and takes them home. And in that idea, it's actually really exciting. <laughs> like for them, like, yes, take us home. Uh, yes. not, I can see for an evangelical, then it would be an exciting time. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, the government is finally reflecting mm-hmm. the, you know, the divine right the way I knew it would. And so they sort of feel like it's cosmic destiny that the stars are aligning as you say to yeah, yeah. as America the new Jerusalem and reconquering and Zionism so <laughs> and there and there been that's been a prominent thread Ugh. throughout evangelical Christianity so and very strong um, so that I think you're absolutely right we can't discount it even if they don't even if uh, most of the the GOP that allow that to happen don't really care there maybe there's some I think uh, and they don't reflect those ideas it's it's hinted in the language no matter what and it's mm-hmm. certainly part of sessions I, of worldview though he's and as one of the top the or the top lawmaker um, that makes it a dangerous kind of worldview because yeah. he's not he's not pandering to a base he believes it Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If you yeah. look at so far, the Trump administration has taken a very hard line stance in Israel. Yeah. 
Um, and that's just, it's very dangerous. It's, it, I mean, that area in general is very dangerous. At any point, there could be a very massive uh, war that could go to nuclear terms. And if it goes to nuclear terms, we're all going to suffer. Oh, yeah. Let I just me... want to say that if they the they come to with uh, pitchforks at my door, um, <laughs> Jesus is my buddy and my savior. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, <they're... laughs> uh, I just I I wanted you. to burn this tape. Up. Up. Um, if ever Canada <laughs> gets infected with this American virus, uh, that uh, that's it. It's my soul will be saved, and yeah. I will have join uh <laughs> the new jerusalem and his christian movement you guys can come yeah. to my barbecue you bring some marshmallows i'll be on the steak oh yeah <laughs> all right so i want to talk about the... <laughs> his name is dsr get up <laughs> um I, I want to talk about the mandate that was set forth the, the official founding of what this group is supposed to do as you know, outlined right here. Um, so uh, really quickly, today I'm announcing our next step, the Religious Liberty Task Force to be co-chaired by the Associate Attorney General and the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Policy, Jesse and Beth. The task force will held, help the department fully implement our religious liberty guidance by ensuring that all Justice Department components are upholding that guidance in the cases they bring and defend, the arguments they make in court, the policies and regulations they adopt, and how we conduct our operations. That includes making sure that our employees know their duties to accommodate people of faith. What do you guys think that means? Because it's way open-ended. Uh, well, let's then, uh, here's, okay, so here's where I kind of hope, or I don't know, I, sometimes I just want to sort of see how then the legal uh, people will challenge us in various ways, mm -hmm. uh, that I hope there's some atheist or some uh, flying spaghetti monster adherent that says, my sincerely held religious belief is that um, all white men uh, should crawl on their knees when they enter my coffee shop, I don't know. Something like that. Something What's your bizarre address? Absurd. And if you're there, <laughs> yeah, exactly. done and done. Something bizarre and absurd that they that they that they document, and even if it's thrown out, but to sort of push this idea that if if you call that you know a sincerely held religious belief, that it can be interpreted so widely, right. then you know ultimately it's it 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 hurts everyone. Uh, I doubt any type of case like that would uh, amount to much because. Uh, the lawmakers would probably throw it out, but I still like the idea that you would challenge it. That so, if this notion of religious persons are always helping America, mm -hmm. um, and they want to promote that idea, I I don't think on on the surface it sounds actually kind of nice. Like the idea that like oh well these are these are the people who founded America, they represent American ideals, we should be protecting them, and that's why even people who don't quite understand how it will likely be applied might think it's not that bad, but it's never going to apply to the pagan or the non-mainstream religious person. Right. It's never going to happen. And anyone who tries to bring that legal challenge, I think, is going to have a very tough battle, uh, although I hope they try. Mm -hmm. Well, we have seen legal challenges to state houses with um, uh, religious iconography or statues. And I, in some, it, again, it depends on where you are, how effective it is. But mm -hmm. it's never thrown out whole cloth. Um, and that's kind of what I love about our system of government particularly is that it's not just up to the state. You know, we have different levels of authority that we can always appeal to um, up into Congress, our Supreme Court or the presidency in order to try to find this balance. And yeah. though I believe that we genuinely are and maybe always have been in an imbalance due to uh, power and money, uh, influence and money, um, it's not necessarily always going to be the case. Um, and this is something where it's naive sounding, but, you know, there is an active opposition right now for a um, convention, an Article 5 convention, in order to strip money from politics happening right now. And if that does happen, then you will suddenly see representatives representing the people because they don't have any other interests 
to then represent. There's no one funding them, telling them what to say, except for the people who elected them. So though I am, um, again, it is a little naive to think that it could happen in our society. It's the only hope I've got. <laughs> so I'm going to hold on to a man. <laughs> Don't stop believing, Adam. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the imbalance that you're talking about is really fundamental to, you know, for so so in the case of uh, the Trump administration making their appeal to a very specific demographic, if you look at the results of the, the election, uh, you find out that actually Donald Trump uh, lost by yeah. a very large margin mm -hmm. uh, of the popular vote. And he won by virtue of the Electoral College. Well, if you look at the history of the Electoral College and you look at the stuff that's been written about it, Americans should look at this stuff. It's, it's oh, yeah. the, the entire presidential election was designed to be an utterly undemocratic endeavor. Yeah. It was never intended to be uh, a democratic endeavor. But it's, it does, uh, if you look at it, you know, philosophically, mathematically, uh, it empowers a certain demographic of the United States so that, yeah, the votes aren't exactly one vote. One person is not one vote. It's mm -hmm. actually yeah. quite different. Yeah. Uh, so, so that that's a that there's an imbalance, an innate imbalance there. Um, and had had if if the democracy were a bit more direct in this sense, then uh, you wouldn't see. I, I think you would see a, a, a much different appeal being made yeah. to the public. Canada isn't one person, one vote either, though. It's a representative. Yeah. So by districts. So if you vote a particular party in your district, that represents uh, X amount of seats uh, in parliament and then the majority seats, is, you know, and they're the leader of that particular party becomes the prime minister. Mm -hmm. But we also have more than one fucking party. God damn it, America. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you know, so like there's, yeah, there's two and three, maybe, you know. I think there's like really only four. one, to be honest. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like if I'm being yeah. fair, it's yeah. there's one party that has winners and losers, and it's 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 such a parable for American freedom. It's like yeah. McDonald's or Burger King. Yeah, that's your, right. here's your choices. Yeah, <laughs> that's freedom right there. Yeah, yeah. Crest or Colgate, which do you want? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. that's, that's I take the one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so. so uh, one last point, though, about yeah. international. I do. I have seen a sentiment among non-Americans that has somehow propelled us all to feel more leftist. Whether mm. or not that will reflect in different nations' actual policy is different. But there's this there's sort of notion like, oh, we don't want to be like Americans now, like at all. Like so, the the, the anti-American sentiment is then fueling people to feel more left, moving along in their political opinions. Like how far that goes, I, I have no idea. But I think that's an interesting kind of thing as well. That that's, just, uh, uh, that's that's why I kind of want to throw out the notion there because you know, the, the, Adam, you were talking about how the Democrats have been kind of derelict in their duties to be a, a strong counterpoint to the Republicans. I do wonder. I think because we're seeing kind of a cyclical nature to this entire thing. I, I think a piece of them were like, yeah, let it go. Well, right. maybe four right. years from now. We'll be able to come back much harder with the pendulum swing. Um, I, so I think they, they are, uh, in, and I, I, again, it goes to the heart of hearts knowing. But if you look at the money, look at where the people come from, you tend to see that they're coming from different parts of the same class of people yeah. and the same industries. Yeah. So I think that they're aware of this kind of symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. and that they're completely yeah. fine with it. So, you know, as long as the, the issues stay rather superficial mm -hmm. and within a certain parameter, they can maintain and if the money control. stays with the rich, right. then right. <laughs> right or left, they don't care yes, as right. long as classism is maintained. Yeah. You can count on two hands the industries that are running America right now. I mean, yeah. they're the military and weaponry. And they're paying both sides. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, that is a funny thing, too. You're seeing that. And that's why, actually, the, the Bernie Sanders campaign or the Ron Paul campaign, they, they show a very interesting side of things. They, they, there's maybe potential there for mm -hmm. something to happen, but it would take a social revolution. Well, it would that, take something that is definitely a, the, the construct of another conversation that, though I would love to have, <laughs> we're going to have to do it on a different show. <laughs> All right. Um, 
thank you guys. Got, we got all night. Come on. <laughs> go pour We're brilliant. Beer. Everyone wants to hear us rant and rave all Look night. They've Everyone hung wants- in this long. <laughs> Um, I, I do want to genuinely thank both of you for um, bringing your expertise and your knowledge and your opinions in this topic. And I know we really did run this gamut from political ideology to who funds the political parties to where this idea comes from of the need of a a religious liberty task force and how it's really ingrained in what America is as not only a nation but as an idea and that how important that idea of freedom is to us in our own really strange way Um, and I can't help but find some appreciation for its absurdity sometimes um, even as I defend its valor in uh, you know opposition to those absurd ideas Um, I just can't help it we've had different moments in history where we've like really come to to grips with what freedom means and uh, I mean I personally think that it's it's uh, it's time for another one but uh, you know, it's a it's it's a question that needs to be challenged often. I think for a healthy any state, a yeah. healthy any country. Well, is there anything? Um, I mean, stepping outside of the conversation, is is there anything you would like to promote or let the people know about um, while you're here on a soapbox? <laughs> Where can the people find you <laughs> online? No, I'm just really happy that there was a conversation like this. You know, we've kind of been touching about it, but yeah. like. We're really entering an anti-intellectual time, oh. and I think if we're going to, uh, you know, survive this this time where re- resources are, this is, you know, that some scientists are calling this the Anthropocene epoch, where it's like everything, mm-hmm. the ubiquitous influence of the human species, um, is really pushing resources to their limits on the planet. We're seeing climate change. We're seeing a lot of very uh, Uh, broad, intense issues facing the species. So you're seeing a lot of different factions resort to tribalism and extremism all over the globe. It's really important, I think, especially if we're going to call ourselves Satanists, that we remain in the intellectual domain as leaders Mm. um, and that we don't succumb to this kind of jingoistic herd mentality. Um, So, you know, especially with mass media the way it is it's making its appeal entirely to that so people yeah. like which that are super important my life has gone in a direction where i'm doing music and things like that but it really takes dedication on a scholarship level to mm-hmm. for these like interdisciplinary oh, cool. things to be brought together <laughs> what's with the, what's with the <laughs> no, seriously, <laughs> we are honored by your presence. Yeah. It's really oh it's gosh! Really great that All right, so then, uh, as an expert, let me then uh, leave you with <laughs> a little bit of uh, expert advice. Uh, due to all the instability, all the anxiety, um, and everything that we've talked about and that you just mentioned here, Darren, um, I want to emphatically state and advise that there is no better time to start your own cult. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm not sure. even joking. You find a spike in uh, new religions uh, during times of great instability. Mm-hmm. And the, one of the reasons is because people feel lost and they don't really know, they can't have answers in, in, the, in the regular sources that they look. So that then you have this sort of outgrowing of like flourishing of new groups and movements and ideas and leaders that uh, respond to the, your anxieties in slightly different ways. Uh, Jesus was one of them uh, in a time of great instability in the Roman Empire, uh, responding to issues of his day. So, and look what happened there. So, all I'm saying is, uh, in a couple of weeks, if you don't hear from me, it's because <laughs> <coughs> I thought up some brilliant plans to fund the rest of my degrees. And um, you can now call me Lord. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't well, know. What my I have a question though. Like, which which penises are allowed to use your bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> All of them. Um, I am. I. I'm an equal opportunity to, to equal opportunity uh, genital exposure. <laughs> like, I don't really care. I just it's mandatory that you expose your genitals. I just don't care yeah. which gender it's attached to. Nice. Shit. I'm pro genital. That's my first <laughs> mandate. 
That's a good stance. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I await the uh, Deicide fan club of Deus in, in this yes. time oh, of wait, uncertainty. Yeah, I have the foundation for a cult, too. This is great. All right, we got projects. All right. Um, <laughs> let me thank everyone for tuning in live and sitting in at, like well after our regular uh, time frame. We appreciate your uh, interest and we appreciate your interaction. I know you guys were um, you know, sliding in comments uh, to each other. I didn't see any outright questions, and so I didn't bring any to the panel here but uh thank you so much for tuning in live and for those of you who couldn't catch it live thank you so much for watching it after the fact it's your interest in this and your um engagement that really keeps me going and makes me want to do stuff like this and makes these ast astounding guests like which zaftig and darren deicide wants to even come on the show and talk about this stuff so thank you all so very much. And uh, which is after Guaranteed Side, I love you both. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks. Thank you so much, Adam. You really keep the bar high. I love <laughs> I it. I appreciate it. Uh, until everyone, we can speak of the devil again. Hail Satan. I love Jesus. <laughs> Sin! <laughs> Hail Satan. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't resist that one. My genitals are out right now. <laughs> this whole time they were.